Amen. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. All right, First John chapter 2, if you want to turn that way, we're going to be in verse 15 through 27 today. So, Lord, we love you. We bless you. We celebrate your, your gospel, your kingdom. We ask this morning that you would be present um, and that you would really mold and transform our hearts. Lord, we need more than just information this morning. We need um, the spirit of the Lord to help us to understand and apply and to fully grasp the truth of your gospel of the scriptures. We love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. Well, we, we talked about for several months last year, uh, Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians and this town, Heronhut, where the gospel really took root of a community. And I've been studying and, and just reading and thinking about John Calvin and Geneva, his ministry in Geneva. Uh, Calvin was very intentional in Geneva. There were some discipleship things they did. So I'm just kind of, you guys know me, I'm just reading and thinking um, about Calvin and thinking about what they did there in Geneva. The The motto of the Protestant Reformation was post tenebris lux. In Latin, that just means after darkness, light. And Geneva was uh, traditionally uh, a city controlled by Rome, by Roman Catholicism and uh, the reformers really worked hard to to push back on on some of the false gospel that was being presented or uh, in that community. Well, and Calvin came after Geneva had thrown off Roman uh, leadership, and Geneva had f- officially become kind of a Protestant city. And uh, kind of one of the leaders there at that point, his name was Pharrell, and he was a great preacher and he preached and he preached and he preached, but he wasn't really an organizer. So they threw off Roman Catholicism. And um, if you can think like nuns were doing a lot of the healthcare work, um, monks were helping with the poor and all of those people left and all they really replaced it with was preaching. Um, and, and that didn't quite work. And so Pharrell had really um, kind of twisted Calvin's arm to stay in Geneva and to help him develop the church there And Calvin just wanted to be a scholar, like just wanted to read in a library and be left alone. And some days I understand Calvin very well because you guys, I'm just, I'm teasing. (laughs) I'm totally teasing. Um, But, but, you know, there's something appealing about just being alone and reading and writing. And, um, well, Pharrell twists Calvin's arm to help him in Geneva, and they start to really work to develop the church in Geneva to teach, teach, to disciple. And the problem was is that, um, well, in Geneva, the government, um, the Genevan church was a government-sponsored church. And part of being a citizen in Geneva meant that it was required to attend church, to attend. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone did, but uh, at one point they would say, if you don't come to church, we're going to fine you. And in, in our records, it shows that they very rarely did that, but um, it's a good strategy. So quit showing up to church, see what I do, homies. <laughs> Your neighborhood's fine. Yeah, I'm about to start dropping them in the box. Um, so, so it's a state-sponsored church. And, but one of the things that the reformers are not allowed to do is they're, or the, the pastors are not really allowed to do church discipline. So they're not allowed to excommunicate anyone or to... Um, to really um, bring, sh- bring correction. And so uh, one year, Pharrell and Calvin are preparing for Easter and they're, they're supposed to do communion. And now the problem for them is they're required by law to serve everyone in Geneva communion, even though, so the citizens are required to come to church and the pastors are required to serve everyone communion. And Calvin is going, I know some of these people are unrepentant sinners. I know some of these people are living sexually immoral and drunken. And the Bible teaches that communion is something that is sacred and that that saints partake in. And so uh, the government is saying, you have to do this. And Calvin is saying, well, the Bible teaches that I can't do this. And so Calvin and Pharrell protest. They preach sermons that say, this is why we're not going to serve communion. And it seems like they hid all of the elements because no one could find them, Um, which is also good strategy. Okay, just hide communion. Um, and when that happened, they were driven out of Geneva. So now Calvin and Pharrell are banished from Geneva by the government because they refused to serve communion to unrepentant people. 
if you can imagine again, Calvin's not so upset about this, okay? He just got kicked out of the city that he didn't really want to be in anyway. So he's ready to go to the library, all right, and to have some coffee and snacks and read. And seriously, he's not like heartbroken. Um, he's actually quite, quite relieved. In this period when Calvin and Pharrell are driven out of Geneva, about a year later, we're talking about like the 1530s, about a year later, a, a Catholic bishop wrote the church at Geneva a letter. And in this letter, the Catholic, a Catholic uh, bishop said, he was actually a cardinal, said essentially, now is your time, Geneva, to return to Rome. You did that Reformation thing, and, um, but here are the reasons why you need to return to being good Catholics, and you need to return to our tradition and our system. And the church at Geneva, they didn't really know how to respond. Calvin had been their theologian, their thinker, and so Geneva wrote a neighboring city called Bern and asked Bern if one of their pastors or theologians would respond to this Catholic cardinal who is now pressuring them to return to Catholicism. Well, Burns said, yes, one of our theologians will respond to the Catholic cardinal, will write a long dissertation as to why you shouldn't be uh, returning to Catholicism. And then Burns turned around and asked Calvin to do it, um, which was really funny. So, so now Calvin has to write a dissertation responding to a Catholic cardinal as to why the Genevans, who just kicked him out of Geneva, should not return to Catholicism. And he just lays out this um, post-Tenebrous Lux. After darkness, the darkness of Roman Catholicism in the medieval era that really uh, taught mysticism and works-based, um, if you don't perform, then you can't receive uh, salvation. You need to go through this penance. Uh, the reformers called that darkness. And the light of the gospel was simply that through faith in Jesus, you could have total forgiveness. Like the grace of the gospel is light that, that but it offers for you um, a clean conscience before God, not because of what you could do, but because of what Jesus has already done on your behalf. And that liberating light, that beauty, that forgiveness, that justification, uh, the reformers said, is the heart of the gospel. And so in Calvin's response, he said this. He said, um, this is a, a, a pretty common quote. But he said, um, wherever sola fide, or faith alone, salvation by faith alone, wherever sola fide is abandoned, the glory of Christ is extinguished, religion abolished, true religion abolished, the church destroyed, and the hope of salvation utterly overthrown. So Calvin responds to this Catholic cardinal and says, wherever faith alone is abandoned, the church is destroyed. We cannot return to Roman Catholicism because you refuse to preach the gospel by faith alone. Now we're writing, we're reading the writings of John as John is writing to a church who's having the same moment, right? There are teachers saying to them, you need to abandon your position and follow us. And in this hour, John is writing to the church, and we talked about this last week, and he's saying, you need to learn to discern. All of 1 John's about discernment. You need to learn to discern who are the true Christians, what is the true gospel, what is true Christian leadership, what is um, the word that you've heard from the beginning through Jesus and his apostles. John is saying, you need to discern what true Christianity is, and by consequence, discerning what true Christianity is requires you to reject the false gospels to reject false teaching. Now, what we find today, and I need you guys to pay attention because again, you are like half asleep. Or me, I can't decide. Um, what we find today is that John's going to situate or contextualize what's happening in these house churches in Ephesus. They have false teachers that they're having to combat. There's a fight taking place. And, and John says, this fight is um, a part of the end time um, plan of God, the, the end time prophetic narrative of God in which there will be an antichrist spirit that tries to pervert the church. So as they're struggling with, just follow me, as they're struggling with false teachers, John says, look, don't forget that these are the last days and in the last days, there's an antichrist spirit that forecludes or foreshadows the final Antichrist 
And part of being a Christian who exists in the last days is learning to be a Christian who resists an antichrist spirit, who resists false gospels, who resists false teachers. So part of being a Christian in the last hour is learning to fight, learning who you're supposed to be fighting, your weapon by which you fight, the word of God. And at some point, I, and I want to argue this this morning, and I know this is like, again, not super fun, but here we go. At some point in every generation, and I think I could prove this to you historically, every generation between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus, that's what the Bible calls the last days, every generation will deal with an antichrist spirit, a false teaching uh, trend that attempts to pervert the church. Every generation, it is a part of, it is an identifying factor of this age in which we live. And so if every generation is gonna have to wrestle with false teaching, I don't know, maybe you should figure out how, what that fight looks like. And, and that, that is where we find John writing today. Again, Calvin's wrestling with false teaching over and over. And Calvin, for all of the controversy when we think about him, uh, really just wanted to be left alone. Um, but there really is no such thing as being left alone in this age. Like you're going to at some point have to look someone in the face and say, that's not the gospel. And I'm sorry that hurts your feelings, but I'm not bending to your doctrine and your new teaching. All right, let me read to you from 1 John chapter 2, and I'll do my best to, to lead us through John's line of thought here. You guys with me? Do you guys want me to ask Elder Jerry to get you some coffee too? Because I will. Um, <laughs> Chapter two, verse 15, you ready? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Notice the delineation here. The world is passing away. That's end time language. But whoever is in the Father will abide forever. There's in, in people who possess eternal salvation who abide forever. And there's a destruction that is taking place in the world. Verse 18, children, it is the last hour. Everybody say last hour. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they have been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. But you, verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Now, again, notice, I want you to notice all of that, uh, what you would call like eschatological language or eschatology, the eschaton is the study of the end. Notice all of the end time language. The world is passing away. We know it is the last hour. You have heard that the antichrist is coming, but even now many antichrists have come. And so John, who, when you like lean back for a second and think, like John wrote the book of Revelation, like John is a, uh, as a, as a person, is someone who's thought deeply about eschatology or the end of all things. And as John approaches a church who's battling false teachers and deception, John says to them, don't forget where you are in the prophetic timeline of God's plan. You're in the last hour. And in the last hour, you have to deal with, fight with, wrestle down, reject and rebuke the Antichrist spirit. So contextually speaking, what we have is a group of believers in Ephesus, in house churches, who have now been infiltrated by what we've called so far Gnostic secessionists, 
If you're new with us, we have teachers who are teaching Gnosticism, which is the idea that people have a soul and a spirit and people have a body. And those two things are so separated that my body could continue in sin while my soul is elevated, my spirit is elevated to a place of purity. And so they're claiming, I'm not a sinner while their body lives in sin. And John just says really plainly, that is dumb. And so these Gnostics, the, the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, are teaching, if you would come to our teaching or our doctrine, our secret knowledge, then you would have an experience, an elevated spiritual status in which you could become pure in spirit while your body continues to sin however you like. And these teachers are promoting what we would call lawlessness. This is lawlessness. They're creating division. We call them secessionists because the Gnostics now, because they've not won the fight with the apostles, the apostles have argued them down and argued them out of the church. The um, secessionists are now, the Gnostics are creating a division. They're doing a church split. And the church split is on the basis of doctrine. And so every Christian in the community has to decide not which leaders they like better, but which leaders proclaim the true gospel. The first thing John says to these people in this situation is, do not love the world. Now, this is the same John who recorded for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So he clearly does not mean do not love the people of the world. He has something else in mind when he uses the words cosmos here. Don't love the world. And then he defines for us, or he gives us three categories, which he calls um, pieces or parts of the world that are passing away. So he tells us what he means by saying the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of life. Don't love these things. These things are from the world and they are passing away. One, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. The desires of the flesh. You should not love the desires of the flesh. They are currently passing away. One, the desires of the flesh are the fallen sinful cravings in my soul that just want pleasure from the world. These desires, these cravings are natural um, pursuits untethered or severed from God's creative order. So you guys know this, but let's just hash it out for a second. Good food is good. Good food untethered from God's creative order is gluttony, right? Um, intimate relations, sexual relations are good in the context of marriage, which procreates and produces family. God calls that good. He created it. Untethered from God's created order, that is so destructive. So the desires of the flesh are allowing your, your sexual desires to run free, untethered, un, un, unleashed to God's creative design. You guys following that so far? So, so John says to people who are teaching, you can be holy while your body does whatever it wants. John says, the desires of the flesh are not from God. They're an exploitation. They're a manipulation and a perversion of God's good created order. You as Christians live under God's design and discipline the flesh. Enjoy a good meal, but don't stuff yourself over and over and over while the poor are going without food. And enjoy intimacy with your spouse, but it should be regulated to the marriage bed that produces family and lifelong covenant. Don't just go after anything your eyes desire. Though There are limitations. The Bible teaches, and you guys know, I don't partake in alcohol. I just don't. I come from a long line of drinkers. Um, would just rather not. Um, but the Bible teaches that a glass of wine is fine. But 24 glasses of wine, every time you sit down in the middle, you got a problem. That it would be an untethering from God's creative order. Does that make sense? Your flesh, your flesh is not king. You, you guys hear me? Your flesh is not the end all be all. And everything your flesh wants, your flesh should not get. Then he transitions to the desires of the eyes. Um, uh, Audrey, do you have that 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 poem back there that I that I gave? It's okay if you don't. Um, but this is from a uh, 
This is from a reformer just a little bit after Calvin and Geneva. And he's really trying to get at what the desires of the eyes are. He says, never having and always desiring. Such are the consequences of him who loves the world. The more he abounds in honor and riches, the more he is seen aspiring for more. He does not enjoy what belongs to him. He wants, he values, he adores what other people have. When he has everything, it is then that he has nothing because having everything, he desires everything still. And this is a good little poetic explanation of the desires of the eyes. It's covetousness. It's always wanting more. It's always looking uh, to another's uh, woman or a man who doesn't belong to you and craving what they have. It's always wanting more money, wanting better vacations and bigger houses and better cars. If you just had that car and, and by God, that's passing away. Your, your vehicles are going to rust and rot. They're not going to satisfy the deep places of your soul. The desires of the eyes, it's a direct, it's a direct spitting in the face of God's provision for your life. We combat covetousness with thankfulness. I combat needing a bigger house with being so thankful that God has provided for me what I have. And I don't know about you, but I haven't slept outside recently. And so the desires of the eyes, people who just want more, need more, those, that, that's passing away and that's not of God. Learn thankfulness. Your natural desires of the flesh need to be submitted to God's design and order and your eyes that want constant wealth and want more, or more comfort, that, that needs to be crucified in you. And the last thing he says is the pride of life. The pride of life, without taking too long, is the idea that the more status you achieve, the more value you attain. Meaning that your role in society, it should build you up or you can pu push your chest out and, 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 and you demand honor and demand respect and everyone should revere you because of the status that you've attained. And that is passing away. And the gospel says that the least of all, the last will be first. So Christians can't live their lives with this great inner um, desire to achieve more and to be seen and to, to, to be the, the, the king in the room. You, you shouldn't always want to be the biggest person in the room. That's not Christianity. The, the, those who will be exalted in the kingdom are those who wash the feet of the poor and serve the sick. Those who are going to be honored in the kingdom that is coming are those who are always willing to take the last seat. And I don't, I don't mean to be too aggressive here, but in our community of, of wealth, in our community where there are a lot of prominent people who feel like they've been really successful and they have been successful in the world's eyes, you need to be adamantly opposing this concept of the pride of life. You need to make sure that you don't think you're better than the people down the street because of which neighborhood you live in. Now, I want you to notice this. Verse 17 says that these things are passing away, not will pass away. They, of course, ultimately will pass away, but these, the desires of the flesh, the, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, the world and its demonic evil systems, they are passing away as the kingdom of God is coming as the gospel of Jesus is preached. So part of what's happening in this age is the kingdom is expanding. The salt of the earth is beginning to permeate different regions and new cultures and unreached people groups are hearing this gospel. And as this gospel is preached, selfishness is being destroyed as the selflessness of Jesus is being exalted. There is a passing away that is taking place now, as the kingdom is coming, and you want to make sure that you are a part of the passing away. You're killing the world systems through your life and proclamation and not praying, God, let your kingdom come while you bring hell in your everyday life. Right? Are you guys, you guys following that so far? Okay. So uh, pay attention again to what's happening. We have Gnostics who are saying, we are really spiritual. We're way more spiritual than you guys. We have secret knowledge and special revelation and... We can live in sin however, I mean, we, our bodies can do whatever our bodies want while we have learned to maintain pure spirituality. 
And, and John is saying this. You, church, in Ephesus are going to have to have the discernment and the backbone to look them in the face and to say, no, thank you. Move along. Create your secession, that's fine, but you can take your cult down the street. We're going to remain faithful to the gospel that was from the beginning. Now, the, 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 uh, what, I, what I want you to notice is that, that John says, anyone who says you can continue to live in your desires of the flesh, continue to sleep with whoever you want, drink whatever you want, eat whatever you want, abuse your body, you know, untether your natural desires from God's order. It's all good. Anyone who says that, John says, they do not have the love of the Father. Now, that's quite contradictory concerning what our culture says today, because culture tells me that if I ever preach against certain sexual acts, then I am unloving. We're being taught that if we, if we ever tell people, hey, your sexual desires need to come under God's creative order, that we are somehow assaulting their humanity by placing restrictions upon them, and we are not loving. And it's an exact reversal of the argumentation of John. John is saying that to let your sexual desires off hinge and pursue whatever they want and have whatever you see, whatever you desire, just get on the internet and, and have a good time. That kind of idea actually destroys your soul. And, and I could prove this to you um, with a uh, hundred studies over and over that pornography is very like wildly destructive to the, to the mental state. That idea that if I ever confront you concerning your sin, I'm unloving is the exact opposite of what John's arguing. He says to not confront people for their sin that is destroying them is unloving. And so you've got to decide who you're going to believe. Culture's narrative or the narrative of the scripture? Now, I'm just on a roll, so you just let me do me. So the world is passing away. The kingdom is coming. And this, John says, is the last hour. And then he says, you know that the Antichrist is coming. And so this is really plain. And, and John really develops a lot of his thought about Antichrist from Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, which says that the Antichrist will speak words against the Most High and wear out the saints. The Antichrist that arises in Revelation 13, there is a final historic coming figure who will be called the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will attempt to deceive, pervert, and draw people away from the true gospel to embrace his false presentation uh, of the gospel. And so the, the Antichrist is coming. And Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, Thessalonica they were worried that they had missed the, the second coming. And Paul says, don't worry. Um, we know that Jesus has not, will not return until the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay, so Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. John is the only person who calls him the Antichrist. So John says, look, we are awaiting the arrival of the Antichrist, and then we know that Jesus is coming quickly. But in our waiting, John says, I want you to know that there is already an Antichrist spirit in the earth. And John says, and already many little a Antichrist have already come. So there are many people in history who have, who have embraced and operated in what John would call the spirit of the Antichrist. The early church really thought Nero was an Antichrist. Nero um, created such havoc on the church. And, and when you walk through history, the church in many times, um, sometimes falsely, but other times I think sincerely, is pointing out a person and saying, this person is so hostile and, and violent towards the faith that they are clearly operating by a spirit which is Antichrist. Okay, do you guys understand that? There is a Antichrist coming, but even now today, John teaches there's a spirit of Antichrist in the earth. Now, what we see historically, and I could show you this biblically too, is that the spirit of Antichrist primarily operates in two ways. The first way is to violently assault, intimidate, um, murder Christians. So um, I don't know why I was telling my daughter this this morning, but I guess she needed to know. I was telling her that Nero... Um, like to set Christians on poles, cover them in oil and set them on fire and use them as like a lamppost. Um, 
I don't my nine year old probably doesn't need to know that, but she does now. Um, Nero was was using force, violence to try to intimidate the church out of their profession of faith. If you keep saying Jesus is Lord, we will kill you. If you keep preaching this gospel, we will burn you at the stake. The Antichrist spirit at times comes with violence on the church. And if you go in the Middle East, um, that's what the Christians are experiencing, an Antichrist spirit that is violently murdering saints and trying to intimidate believers out of their confession. That's the first way. In our culture, I would argue that we have an antichrist spirit at work that is not trying to violently destroy us and intimidate us, but is trying to pervert us. So in other times, and this is what they're experiencing in the church in Ephesus that John's writing to. There's no one with a knife at the throat of the Christian saying, you have to follow us. But there is someone saying, hey, we got a better way. We have a higher way. We know more than you. We've got a better teaching. And, and that would be to pervert the antichrist spirit that comes with a false gospel to pervert. Now, if you take that thought, again, which I think I could establish as a thoroughly biblical thought, and you just think about it for 20 or 30 minutes, you could ask yourself, how is it that an antichrist spirit is attempting to pervert the gospel in American Western Christianity? I don't know, that takes me about three minutes. Okay, um, so when you hear people espousing this gospel that says, um, I have this later in the notes, but I'm running out of time already, so uh, because you guys don't listen well. Um, the, um, <laughs> there was a season, I was really young. I think I had been in full-time ministry for like six months. And there was a trend, um, books being written, and they were small groups in churches that were teaching it. And it was, it was leaning towards uh, what you would call like hyper grace. And part of the teaching was essentially this. All of your past, present, and future sins are already forgiven because of the cross of Jesus. Therefore, you never, they actually taught, and I could show you this in books, Christians should never repent. If Christians repent, they are somehow insulting the gospel of Jesus. Now, what they were teaching is that because the, the work of, of Calvary was final, that there was never a need for repentance, and, and essentially, you should never feel remorse for your sinful activity. Um, now, where does that go? That goes to lawlessness, right? Like, live however you want, it doesn't matter. Um, and now you could say, like, that's obviously stupid, but I promise you, 10 years ago, it was being passed around, coded in very spiritual language. And the people that were promoting it, if you ever came against them, they would say, you don't understand grace. And they would say, you are, they'd go to Galatians and say, you're a promoter of the law. You're trying to say that if we don't repent, then we're, it's just like circumcision. If we don't get circumcised, that we're not really saved. And now I've been saved for like, not I've been saved for a season, but I've been in full-time ministry for like six months. And I'm having to have serious debate with men who are 40 years my senior, who said they've been Christians for decades. And I'm having to look them in the face and say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Now, you know, that I'm a little bit stubborn. So that wasn't so hard. Um, but there are, tre there are um, theological trends doctrinal trends that will rise up. And one of the things the church in our day in the West needs to do is to ask a simple question. Is this what we heard from the beginning? Is, is this scripture? And, okay, now I'm off on a tangent here. You started it. Um, when, we, when we think about what, what we call extra biblical ideas, and particularly in movements like ours, I can sit down with people who will give me like 10, forgive me because I'm going to step in a little bit of mud for a second, who will give me 10 doctrinal statements about generational curses and why you should, like I know people that know more about generational curses than they do about the cross of Calvary. Um, and the problem I have with that is like, that's not a biblical phrase. Like I don't, I, I mean, show me where Paul taught on generational curses. I don't see it. Um, that's not to say that there's not a such thing as sin patterns that are passed along generation. I just told you that I don't drink alcohol because I come from a long line of alcoholics. Um, yeah, like sin patterns can be passed from generation to generation. And certainly if you, if you sin in the same way that your father sinned, certainly there might be demonic activity attached to it. So on one hand, I'm going, ah, whatever. But on the other hand, if your entire Christian faith is about this extra biblical idea of being cursed because your great, 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 great grandparent 
may or may not have participated in some occultic activity, like, I don't know, I would just go to the cross and say, Lord, wash me and cleanse me. I don't know that you need an eight-point doctrinal statement about what you believe about generational curses because the New Testament doesn't think you need one. It certainly doesn't give it. So, so that idea is extra biblical, and extra biblical is not always bad. Sometimes extra, like, um, trigonometry is extra biblical. Um, that's why I hate it. You, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not like the Bible intends to, like, I have a, my oldest son right now is struggling with American history. Like, of course, the Bible doesn't talk about American history. It wasn't, America wasn't there, you know, as a nation yet. And so it's not like the Bible is exhaustive on every topic. But what Paul teaches is that we have all we need for life and godliness in the scripture. And so what you should teach one another is not, hey, come over and let's have a, let's have a, a Bible study where we go through this book of the latest prophet and he talks about his revelation about generational curses. What you should do is say, let's have a Bible study and I don't know, study the Bible. And, and y'all hear me like, for some reason that's so offensive. For some reason it's like Caleb is, the, Caleb is evil for saying stuff like that. But man, it's just, it's really common sense, biblically speaking. Um, and so we don't want to live in extra biblical land. And what's happening today is those who are living in, and Paul tells the Galatians, ignore people who keep wanting to talk about their angelic visions. Paul says, just ignore them. Like, don't, don't talk with them. What's happening today is we have prophets in, in the West who are constantly having angelic visions, and their angelic visions are starting to sound a lot like New Age. And for some reason... I don't, I'm, a, I'm mean if I say that. And it's like, sometimes you have to be willing to be seen as mean to defend the truth. Okay, so we've got lots of new age language floating around the church. And I'm just saying, as for me, and as long as I'm the pastor of this church, and I can tell you as a fact, as long as these elders are elders of the church, we're just going to be biblical. And you can take the new age extra biblical stuff back to YouTube, Okay. And if all your doctrine comes from YouTube and never your systematic study of the Bible, you might have a problem. The last thing Paul says, or John says, that's really interesting is he says, you have no need for a teacher. Now, now that's really funny because like, you, what do you mean you're teaching? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm, he's, he's teaching as he writes, but he says you have no need for a teacher. And it's really clear that what he's saying is you don't need a new teacher. Um, so the apostle Paul in Ephesians four says that, um, there are apostles, prophets, uh, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, like teaching is a part of the Christian faith for sure. But, but teaching what John is referring to here, teaching is always about expounding upon what has been said. Does this make sense? It is never biblical teaching is never me sharing with you eight parts to my latest dream and why you need to embrace this new teaching about higher spiritual, like that, that's never what biblical teaching is. Teaching in the Bible is always expounding upon the text of scripture, helping people to understand and apply what Jesus taught the apostles. Okay, that's not to say that you're good God, I'm a good preacher. I don't know what you guys are doing right now, but I'm like, woo. Or I just had a little caffeine hit, okay? Um, that's not to say that prophecy has no place in the church. It certainly does. But prophecy is not teaching. And again, if your entire Christian diet is listening to the latest deliverance minister or prophetess or, you know, dreamer, uh, there are people saying crazy things. Like they had dream that there's an extra chapter to the book of John and they're going to release it. Like that's heresy, just heresy. Um, the entire premise when he says you have no need for a teacher is you have the teaching. He says that word that abides in you from the beginning. What is he referring to there? The plain gospel which you have heard from the beginning, which abides in you, which dwells in your soul. Then he says you have no need for, the te for a teacher because you have the anointing. That, that word anointing, we use it a lot in cultures like ours, but it's actually pretty rare biblically, at least in the New Testament. It's a rare word. Um, John, I may be the only one that uses it, I think. Um, it means that you have the Spirit of God resting upon you and in you. 
So the reason that we don't have need for new teachers is because we have the word that was from the beginning. We have the word and we have the spirit. So how do we combat the antichrist spirit in the earth that wants to pollute and deceive us is twofold. We cling to the word which we've had. And we cling to the spirit which we received at salvation. That we encounter as we press into the baptism of the spirit and secondary fillings of the spirit. We cling to the spirit. So I don't need a Gnostic, elevated, higher experience. I just have the Holy Ghost and the gospel. And, and follow me, man, because again, this is controversial. I, I don't need uh, some prophet on YouTube to explain to me, good gosh, you, you did this to me today. Um, do I use names? I won't use names. I will use names. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> watch, this is what happens. I'll use names when I'm not being recorded in the next service. That's how that goes. Um, I'll just say this. There were prophets at major conferences, which you would all know, who are teaching the church how to ascend to the third heaven and for your spirit to leave your body and soar into the heavenlies. Like there's nowhere where Paul says, by the way, let me teach you to leave your body and soar. Into. Like that sounds just new age to me, dude. Um, and, and you've got to have the discernment. You guys follow me? The discernment, the biblical literacy to hear someone give you eight points about why generational curses are the most important thing in the Christian life and you have to have the biblical literacy to say, I don't know, I've read the New Testament for about 10 years over now, and I've never read that passage. And the confidence to say it. And, and again, that doesn't mean that, that there can't be generational sin patterns that are demonically, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that like, I'm not cursed because my great, great grandfather may or may not have been a Mason. I am blessed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am bought and purchased by the blood of the lamb. And the enemy has no foothold in my life as long as I'm clinging to the word which I had from the beginning and the spirit of God, which I possess through being born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. Like I, the enemy is not the, I'm not staying up all hours of the night trying to understand if maybe a demon got a hold of me. Like I ought to stay up all hours of the night trying to say, how could I have more of God? And how could I be more effective in preaching this gospel? And what does it really mean to be bought and purchased adopted, belong to Jesus fully. And finally, if I could just really believe that, then I could have real life, not biting my nails all night, wondering about so what someone said on some. And, and this feels like I'm being lighthearted, but man, I just mean this, like, I'm not doing that. And I'm sorry if you've been under people who have, and I'm sorry if you've watched people on YouTube and churches on YouTube who, share their angelic experiences and have hours and hours of what this angel taught them, like not doing it. Um, we're we're going to stick with the spirit and the word, which we've heard from the beginning. You guys okay with that? Now I have like 18 more pages of notes. So sit down and be quiet. <laughs> Just tease. The, oh, the last thing I'll say, I'll say this. He says that um, he moves to the idea of perseverance. That, that the saints have to persevere through the last hour by resisting the Antichrist spirit that's trying to deceive them. And the idea of perseverance is the P to Calvin's tulip. I'm not a Calvinist, but um, the P was perseverance of the saints. I do believe this one. And Jesus says, those that persevere to the end will be saved. So there is a sense in which part of your duty in this last hour is to persevere through demonic Antichrist deception. And that perseverance through it looks like clinging to the spirit and the word and having enough boldness and boldness and kindness. It's kind to look at people and say, I think you're wrong. It's kind to say, that's not biblical. I love you and I don't, I'm not belittling you, but that's not, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's kind. Um, you're going to have to have that boldness, discernment, and kindness to persevere in this last hour because there will be people at some point who come to you and say, Christians should never repent. Just enjoy your sin. If you go ahead and stand to your feet.